Hello and welcome to this very special episode of Ship Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. Today, June the 8th, is World Ocean Day. It's an annual event where people from across the world celebrate the ocean, its importance in our lives, and also how each of us can protect it. Even if we think we're land lovers, we are connected to the, the Earth's ocean. This is the third year that Royal Museums Greenwich has celebrated this, and obviously the museum itself, the buildings are closed, but the curators and the expertise and the enthusiasm is all here. So we're doing it differently. We're doing an online event this year. And so, but throughout the day, throughout World Oceans Day, there are lots of activities that you can find on the museum's website at rmg.co.uk slash World Oceans Day. And there's videos and debates and kids activities, all kinds of things. So do go to that website to get the full World Oceans Day experience. And also, if you want to get in contact with us, you can search for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. So let us get to the topic of the day, the oceans. Our ocean is the biggest feature on Earth. It is the blue of our blue planet. It's a critical part of our life support system and it plays a huge role in human civilization, even if you never actually see it because trade routes and leisure activities, culture and food supplies all depend on our oceans. But it also plays a much more invisible role, you know, providing oxygen, dictating the weather, to providing nutrients to land, making sure that the earth isn't too hot and isn't too cold. It plays actually a really fundamental role in the way that planet earth is. But in the modern world, we often forget about it. And so we treat it badly. And our discussion today is all about the relationship between humans and earth's ocean. Um, even though we're distant from the ocean, we need to regain this relationship to improve it. And it isn't just a luxury, it's a matter of survival. So let me introduce to you our four fabulous uh, contributors today who are going to help me explore this topic. We have Lisa Kapurkwaluk, who is the Vice President International Affairs of the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada. Uh, we have Laura Boone, the Lloyd's Register Foundation Public Curator, Contemporary Maritime at Royal Museums Greenwich. We have Dr. Michael Pinsky, who is an artist whose work has been exhibited at the Tate Britain and the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Saatchi Gallery and other such um, illustrious places. And we also have Professor Alex Rogers, who's a deep sea ecologist and the science director of Rev Ocean. And to start with, it would be great if each of you could introduce yourselves just briefly and, and share your connection with this topic. So, Alex, you can go first. Yeah, uh, thanks, Helen. Um, I'm a marine ecologist. I've done most of my work in, in the deep ocean. I'm currently science director for Rev Ocean. We're an organization based in Norway looking for solutions to ocean problems. Lovely, thank you. Laura, you can go next. Of course. Um, so lots of people, my relationship with the ocean started through kind of family holidays to the seaside, um, but now at the museum, um, I study our relationship with the ocean. Um, and how we're reliant on it for day-to-day -day life. Lisa, how about you? Yes, I'm uh, from uh, Pouvernito, a small Inuit community in uh, northern Quebec, and I'm vice president for uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada, International Affairs, and I represent uh, Inuit, uh, speaking on behalf of them, in international fora and very often uh, that means uh, speaking uh, on issues related to arctic waters our oceans and and uh, environment and uh, communications and everything else that touches on our lives thank you very much and michael I, um, I'm an artist and I make uh, primarily installations which engage with um, climate change and in that way I've met, um, I'm interested in the role that the ocean plays in terms of climate change and I have made work previously that looks at sea level rise um, but something that I'm particularly interested in in the moment is um, how algae absorbs carbon and how that could be maybe one of the things that we use to mitigate um, climate change in the future. Fabulous. Well, we're going to explore each of your perspectives a little bit more because each of you have brought some photographs to illustrate uh, that re the relationship that you have with the ocean and your interest in it. So we're going to take a little bit of time to explore those and we'll start with Lisa. Now, Lisa, you've brought us a map. Tell us yes. about this map. 
Yes. So uh, this map I, it illustrates uh, where Inuit uh, in the circumpolar world live. And so Inuit Circumpolar Council International represents uh, all the Inuit li living in four countries. So um, from uh, west to east, we have uh, Kalatli Nunat, which is Greenland. And um, it's known to be part of uh, Denmark. And then uh, there are Inuit in Canada, and uh, Inuit of Alaska, and of course in um, uh, Chukotka, which is uh, part of Russia. And we all know ourselves uh, with different names, but in general, um, we call ourselves Inuit. And the uh, homeland uh, in general, in all of these countries, we call it Inuit Nunat, even though it is um, divided in, in international jurisdictions and, and even in provincial jurisdictions. So we all live with different political and economic realities. Um, but most of all, um, we all live in coastal areas and we rely on uh, uh, the marine regions um, for food security and it's our link to our culture. We often say that the sea is our highway as we are just, you know, subsisting and living off, uh, not only off the land, but off, off the marine areas. And and perhaps, could you say something a little bit about um, the, so what's, very impressive to Westerners, especially about indigenous communities, is their observation of the ocean, that it's not just that features like the ocean are there, but that the, if you're watching them every day because they're your livelihood, you really, you see the details, it becomes much more part of your life. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, um, we number 180,000 Inuit in this circumpolar region in the four different countries. And so uh, every day uh, in the summer, let's say, for example, uh, as the ice has, has gone, gone away, we'll go fishing. The children, the families, the women, uh, we'll all bring our fishing rods and, and uh, bring home fresh Arctic char, salmon, whitefish, what, whatever is in that ocean that comes out really, really fresh. And there's seals, there's bowhead whales that we rely on from east to west. And um, uh, there's seafood. And so we uh, venture regularly out by boat um to the seas and the rivers uh, so uh, that's a very important link in our daily lives uh, we also travel between the communities by boat to visit with family or to go camping during the summers uh, so a lot of the communities are also very close to the the coastal areas and uh, climate change can be seen when the infrastructure, uh, particularly uh, infrastructure, is impacted by coastal erosion or the thawing of permafrost. So those are things that we uh, observe um, as someone coming from outside of the communities. And you, you've also got a second picture to show us, which is of a marine conservation area. And tell me a little bit about the, um, you know, how the Inuit are, are talking about protecting these waters. Yes. So um, with the realization, um, you know, the climate change is impacting us in, in more ways than one. So one of the impacts is the uh, receding of, of ice and uh, smaller uh, ice periods in the oceans. And uh, between uh, Greenland and, and Baffin, uh, there are 
there is a, a body of water which is called Piquela sur Soir, North Water. So um, Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, heard um, the concern from Inuit from these two regions saying we need to conserve this area because it's a very important um, north, north water polynya. So it remains unfrozen throughout the year. So it's a very important breeding ground for various marine mammals and that we rely on, of course. And, and so um, the effort has been on the way to create this area as a conservation, marine conservation area, which is an international area since um, it would require an agreement between Greenland and Canada to create it, first of all, uh, and define the borders of this uh, conservation area, but also to co-manage it so that Inuit are involved in the co-management of this particular area. So, you know, co-managing would be participating in the research, having Inuit um, uh, participate in the co-management regime. And, and the other uh, aspect of, of creating this conservation era is um, Inuit from both from Greenland communities and the Canadian Inuit communities wish to travel freely between uh, in this area between each other and be able to visit and, and do a cultural exchange with each other without travel restrictions you know between countries you know we have passports that are required normally but we wish to see an arrangement where Inuit will be able to um, travel freely uh, in those communities so it's uh, it's not done yet but the two countries are starting to to speak with one another uh, to start that process of creating this uh, um, Piquela Sorsoir conservation area. Thank you very much. We'll come back to yes. lots of those issues. We're going to move yes. on now uh, to introduce Laura, who has a photo of something which conceptually almost couldn't be further away from everything Lisa was just talking about. Laura, tell us a little bit about this picture and the object that it represents that shows. Of course. Um, so this is actually one of the museum's uh, biggest objects. Um, this is normally the, the view that I have every morning that I come into work, although I haven't uh, been obviously seeing it recently. Um, and this is the Cutty's Ark. Um, so the Cutty's Ark is a tea clipper. Um, it's 150 years old. Um, and this might seem like a slightly odd um, object for, for someone who's a contemporary curator to talk about. Um, but I think when we start to think about kind of our relationship with the ocean, um, Historical ships are really important. This was the way that all trade used to happen. It was also how people were able to experience and explore the world um, pre the kind of very, very relatively recent um, edition of kind of air travel. But why the Cartes Arc specifically is of interest um, is because um, the year that it was launched, 1869, um, is also a massive kind of turning point and change point. This is also um, the start of the Suez Canal. Um, and suddenly, actually, fossil fuel um, powered ships, the Cutty's Ark is obviously sail powered, she's um, almost carbon neutral as a, a form of um, transportation. Suddenly, actually, shipping, just like it is today, became very, very reliant on fossil fuels. You were no longer restricted by needing to have um, kind of wind um, to support that travel. And what we've seen now is that global trade is, is very, very easy. Um, the, the fuels are relatively cheap. About 85% of all of the products that we're using every day are coming to us via by, by ship. But actually, this is having a huge environmental impact. Mm. And it's interesting, Laura, that in a way, it's almost come full circle that now people are talking about the impact of shipping and, and there's some moves to move back the other way. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so I actually have a prop here. Um, so one of my lockdown treats um, is some coffee here that was actually brought um, to the UK via sail ship. So as you were um, saying, again, there's been a kind of resurgence in looking at how we can move away from fossil fuel. 
Um, there's some really bleak statistics. We know that every year um, it's estimated that around 400,000 people are dying prematurely um, just due to the emissions from shipping. Um, and around 14 million children are suffering from childhood asthma. Um, although shipping is much more environmentally friendly than things like putting things on flight, we actually do need to find a solution. So um, there is the sale by cargo network who are looking at, just like my coffee got to me um, via sail ship from all the way from Colombia. Can we actually start using sail ships again? Um, although this is obviously um, quite hard to kind of replicate um, to the scale that we need. Um, obviously, the more that we buy local um, that's produced near to us, um, so it doesn't need to come all the way across the world, buying less in the first place, uh, reusing things, reducing the amount we're buying, um, but also looking at if we can start to kind of reimagine these technologies. So although we might not be moving back to kind of pure sail ships like the Cutty's Ark, can we begin to use um, solar power and wind power in slightly different ways, utilising um, really smart technologies? And how does it, um, how do you see this, because oh, what's it like to be a curator in this, because you, obviously your job is that you are curator of a museum, what, what sorts of objects can you collect, how, what, what is of interest when you're, because it, it feels like we might be, you might be responsible for documenting this transition perhaps away from a completely fossil fuel fueled world, um, how, what are you looking for? Yeah, um, so this is actually kind of quite a big challenge. Um, there's a little bit of kind of uh, prediction in there. So um, for example, when the museum was collecting things from Extinction Rebellion, um, a protest movement here in the UK, we were taking a little bit of a gamble that they, those objects were gonna stay significant. Um, and that kind of that movement wasn't just a kind of one-off thing that, that everyone would kind of forget about. Um, one really important project that we do is also oral history, so recording the kind of personal accounts from people who are kind of actively working in these areas, um, because obviously their personal experience tells us so much more than perhaps kind of documents or um, objects might. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, let's move on now to Michael. Um, and Michael, your photo is something, it's an installation that you, you created. Tell us a little bit about this. Um, so um, we're starting with uh, an installation or an intervention um, from 2012 um, that I called Plunge. And basically I was marking major monuments in London with where the sea level perhaps could be in a thousand years. So I took a... Um, all the figures that I could get my hands on and extrapolated them over a thousand years and came up with a kind of notional 28 metre rise. But of course, this, you know, is entire, could go any possible way. Um, but it was this kind of notional um, sea level rise. And what, what interested me was um, rather than marking buildings, I was interested in marking these monuments that are really at this moment in time. Um, where Britain was really expanding with its, uh, its imperialist notions and with um, the Industrial Revolution. So starting to really live beyond the means of, of you know, the country itself and looking at other countries to, uh, you know, rape, pillage, um, you know, get whatever resources it can from that um, to help build these cities and build these monuments. So um, something is a kind of built in humour. I mean, the, the image there is the Duke of York's column. And of course, it doesn't matter how much sea level rises, you know, Nelson will be safe on top of his column and the Duke of York will be safe on top of his column. And I think that is actually um, almost deliberate, you know, that they're way above us in the sky, looking down, completely safe from, from the impacts of this kind of uh, national greed. Tell us a little bit about the notion of using art in order to change people's um, perceptions, because obviously the way that the, the general perception is that what you do to someone to change someone's mind is present facts to them. You give them the numbers, you show them the sea level rise, but you, but you do it in terms of numbers and written down things and facts. But what you do is more touching people's emotions. How, how does that work? Does it, do you, what sort of reaction do you get to the things you create? Um, well, I mean, that, as I say, that particular piece is now eight years old. And um, 
I remember photographing those columns and people not realizing I'm the artist and they go, what's that thing up on the column? And then someone might know, someone might not know. Um, and even if they did know, I still felt like they didn't know what to do about it. Um, so in a way, a lot of my pieces from there, I mean, another piece called Low Key Door, where I recover objects that people have thrown into ports and canals and then the water, and then I put them on the surface of the water. Um, and then a more recent piece called Pushing Pods, um, both engage people in issues that are, in a way, something that they can actually do something about. Um, so this idea of not putting waste into the oceans, into our waterways, is something that people can choose to do or not to do. Um, so by confronting them with their own waste and their own actions, it does lead to the possibility of change. And then more recently with pollu pollution pods, I actually had some environmental psychologists work um, on it as their primary study for four years to work out really empirically whether it changes people's perception. So just climate. to explain these pollution pods very briefly, because they are, it was a brilliant idea. You basically created pods from different places so you could breathe, you could experience the pollution in different locations. Yeah, I mean, basically it's a sequence of five geodesic domes that are built in a ring and you travel from one city to another. And you start off because I, uh, originally made this piece in Norway, we start in the pure air of Norway, um, a place called Tautra on the coast. And then you move to London and you have the diesel fuel fumes and then you move to New Delhi where you have crop burning and diesel and rubbish getting burned and then to China with the sulfuric emissions from industry and then to San Paolo where they use ethanol as their fuel base. Um, but the idea is that you get that kind of direct impression you would when you get off a plane, where, you know, if you get off in a tropical country, that it hits you in the face, the atmosphere. And I wanted that experience, but I also wanted people to experience it without having to travel to experience it. <laughs> so I've had, I've had a lot of politicians go through this and have discussions with them, you know, in New Delhi and saying, this is what it's like in New Delhi. And they're all sweating away and going, I can't stay in here. And I'm going, you can't stay in here for five minutes, but people live in this environment all year. So it's very um, direct. Well, Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. We're going to move on now uh, to Alex. So Alex has a brilliant photo for his first photo, which is a very personal connection to the ocean. Alex, tell us about this. Um, yeah, it's a, a photograph of me when I'm probably, I don't know how old I am here, maybe about seven. And in the background, there's a, a lobster fishing boat. And that's my grandfather, two of my uncles, who for some strange reason are wearing uh, something that looks like bowler hats, and my father launching the boat. And this is where I got my interest in the ocean used to go over every summer and uh, I used to spend all my time on these limestone uh, flags as we called them with the most amazing rock pools in them full of life and I also used to go out on the boat with my grandfather and uncles fishing lobsters and looking at all the amazing uh, creatures which would come up as well as the lobsters themselves which go pretty amazing animals uh, in themselves, uh, but also crabs and uh, starfish, uh, sea cucumbers, sometimes conger eels, which was really scary. Um, and uh, yeah, all sorts of animals. That's and, the perfect uh, introduction for a marine ecologist. That's the per perfect upbringing. Yeah, absolutely. And let's move on to some of your work since, because you do have a second photo as well of a fish that most people probably haven't heard of, although it's got several names. Um, yeah. Tell us about this little fish. So just after my um, PhD, uh, which was in the Isle of Man, I became really interested in the deep ocean and in particular about underwater mountains or sea mounts. And I came acro across this chap. This is uh, what's called an orange ruffy. And it became the target of major 
deep water fisheries targeted at seamounts because this fish uh, actually spawns or reproduces over seamounts. They gather in huge uh, shoals around seamounts, almost forming a donut sometimes around the top of the seamount uh, to release their eggs and um, make sure the next generation comes along. But what people didn't realize when they started fishing this animal is they live for more than 150 years and they don't mature until they're 30 or 40 years old. And all these types of features are things we associate with having a low resilience to uh, fishing. And of course, these fisheries uh, wiped out many stocks of these uh, fish. They live at depths down to around a thousand meters or more. And also because when they're threatened, these orange roughy die for the seabed, they're fish using bottom trawls. And those trawls did huge damage and indeed are still doing huge damage to really incredible communities of things like uh, corals and sponges which live on these uh, underwater mountains. So just talk to us briefly because there's this problem with the deep sea before we get going on the rest of the discussion. The problem with the ocean from the point of view of a lot of people is that you can't see it. You can yeah. maybe dangle things over the side of a boat and see what comes back up. But that's especially true for the deep sea. How do people relate to the deep sea when basically what we see are kind of weird photographs of fish that look, frankly, like aliens quite a lot of the time? How easy is it to get people to connect to all of that? Yeah, um, it really depends on the person. Some people have a really you know, averse reaction to deep sea creatures. You know, you see these fish which are just all teeth and stomach. Um, and some people sort of go, oh, God, that's disgusting. Um, other people like me think, oh, gosh, that looks really weird. That's, you know, it's really cool, amazing looking mm -hmm. creature. It's clearly really uh, well adapted to its environment, which is at those sorts of depths, completely dark, uh, 1,000 meters. It's a uh, 100 atmospheres of pressure for 101 and um and food is quite scarce so um uh, you know for me that they're, they're really endlessly fascinating and when i talk to students say about some of these adaptations these animals have uh, they also become really fascinated so the, 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 yeah it's a good good place for curious minds so if you're if you're just joining us this is Royal Museum Greenwich's uh, World Oceans Day discussion panel we're joined by Lisa Kapurkuluk, Laura Boone, Michael Pinsky and Alex Rogers and we're discussing the the nature of the human relationship to the ocean um, and so I'd like to start on a broader discussion and the first thing I, I'd like to deal with is is a question of social justice. The oceans are shared. We have a planet, every, every coast that has an ocean is directly connected to every other coast that has an ocean. And there is an issue of social justice here. And, and I'd like to, to go to Lisa about this. Some of the issues mm. where the people who live in a particular area are connected to people a long way away. And it's Absolutely. not clear who decides. Absolutely. Yes. Well, bit. sure. Um, Laura mentioned fossil fuels uh, when she spoke about her work uh, and um, I think it's uh, uh, very uh, linked to you know the work uh, we're doing at ICC to to be included in the discussions at the International Maritime Organization so uh, lately like recently and the International Maritime Organization is based in London. So I've been there a couple of times now uh, to encourage the ban of the use of uh, and carriage for use of heavy fuel oil by ships passing through Arctic uh, waters. And so um, uh, not everyone is interested in, in accepting this ban uh, for economic reasons uh, very much, but uh, it remains that there is um, increased shipping in the Arctic waters. So uh, we want to see our waters uh, uh, prevented from, uh, uh, 
sorry, protected from any potential spills of heavy fuel oil. And then even if it would not be heavy fuel oil, let's say uh, natural gas uh, that's used by ships, it's an option. But even if there would be a spill, um, we would still need to have the uh, response capacity to be able to clean up any type of spills. So and there are did, various sorry. issues around how, that. How does how is the voice of indigenous communities? How does that how is that balanced with? Because there is this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Western world has done what it wanted for a long time. Yes. And then and now there are global issues that do affect everyone, and the connections are very clear. But what what is the response to indigenous voices being heard in these forum? Right. So um, we encourage the recognition and use of indigenous knowledge so that's the very first thing i want to say is let's look and, and recognize and understand indigenous knowledge there is scientific knowledge which a lot of policy makers and decision makers um, base their decisions on and you know that relationship with uh, of scientific knowledge, scientists with the indigenous people of a certain area has not always been equal. And so we are now insisting, hey, listen to us. This is our knowledge. We know our area and our particular, no our particular knowledge, indigenous knowledge is very much linked to our land, our environment, our waters, our culture, our language, everything. Um, and so that's why we're saying uh, it's side by side uh, recognition of indigenous knowledge with scientific knowledge. And let's move on from that to Michael, because Michael, you were also talking about social justice, but in a, diff a slightly different way in a bygone age. And this the concept of colonial, the colonial history. Um, how how much are people aware of that today? You know, most of your the works we've talked about of yours have been in the Western world. Does it surprise people to to realise how much imbalance there has been in the past? Um, I think people are aware of the history. Um, I, I mean, they are aware, but and they're becoming more aware. But it's just that thing that this curve of consumption you know, has moved exponentially ever since uh, the point of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the certain countries, including Britain, uh, started to consume more than it could produce itself. And now as a globe, we produce, we consume more than uh, we produce, um, you know, three times a year. Um, so it's all part of that curve. And I suppose it's, it's about um, changing people's expectations in terms of what they can consume. And it does interest me, this kind of balance between where some people believe we have technical solutions for everything and that we don't need to change our lifestyles. And you see that with the oceans as well, like these huge kind of contraptions to start getting all the rubbish out of the oceans, like we can just get it all out of the oceans. And I mean, I suppose we have to work in both directions, but primarily we have to change our lifestyles. Um, that, you know, we have to consume less and produce less waste. Um, and I think a lot of the work that I do in low key door being particularly one is looking at the cycle between consumption and waste that we can only consume if we have a very expensive effective waste process and by having such good waste processes in place it actually encourages consumption because if we couldn't get rid of anything we wouldn't have any space to store all this stuff that we buy and of course the ocean's just a massive place that we can throw up throw things and i mean you go beyond that we'll throw everything into outer space you know we let's, need let's that. pick up on that point because i'd like to hear alex's view on this because you know your work on ocean policy there is this question in the ocean of who decides and the deep sea is a particular place where there are mining companies there are nations that are nearby how how does how do we make decisions about what happens to the ocean how do we mix up and and give fair you know hearing to all these different points of view 
Well, uh, within 200 miles, 200 nautical miles of the coast, it's the coastal state, so it's the country. But beyond that, in uh, what is often called the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction, then, you know, things become a little less clear, I think is the diplomatic way of putting it. Um, there is something called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that really presents a set of rules for who decides what happens out in these waters. And often it comes down to the flag state of whatever vessel is involved in an activity out in these waters. So if it's a fishing boat, it would be the flag state of that fishing boat the flag is flying that is supposed to regulate what that vessel is doing. But we're talking about a frontier here, really. Somewhere which is distant from uh, the rule of law to some extent, uh, where there are no boundaries. You know, you don't have boundaries um, as you do on land. Uh, so, you know, whether it's a boundary around a field or around your own home, those sorts of things don't exist out in the open ocean. So we need a so, new way of thinking about it. So I just, I wanted to move on actually to ask uh, Lisa a specific question, which is about the importance of story. When we're talking about our relationship with the ocean, um, stories are really important. And, and that's a really important part of, of Inuit culture. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yes, um, it sure is. <laughs> there are many stories and, and uh, s legends Perhaps you know the story of Sedna Well, who was the the um, the woman who had uh, gone down into the sea. Her her knuckles had been cut off while she was trying to hang on dearly for life on the boat of her father. But those pieces of knuckles turned into sea mammals, such as the whales and the seals and the walrus and and uh, fish and every sea mammal that uh, exists in the Arctic. And then she became the protector of the sea, the sea mammals. And you needed a special communication with her in order for those animals to, to offer themselves to you as a hunter so you could catch them. You, you needed to appease her as a hunter, as a shaman. And today we can regard her really as a symbol of climate change as well so as the story continues to evolve in our contemporary times we can see sedna as a symbol of the uh, the environmental mitigation or or protection of environment when we have to deal with uh, a lot of the negative impacts of environmental change so storytelling is very important as we go along uh, through our and lives. Laura, perhaps you have a comment on this as well, because of course the, one of the things a museum does is, it, is it, it tells new stories, it tells the old stories and it helps to build new stories. Do, do you see yourself as a storyteller? How, how, what's the museum's role in that? Um, yeah, I definitely think that it, in museums, stories are incredibly important and maybe traditionally museums were, were seen somewhere that um, had kind of lots of facts and we may be told the, the stories of very important people and leaders, um, whereas now telling the, the stories of, of individuals and communities across the world is so, so important. Um, and, and, both to, and also, I think now museums are increasingly through roles like mine, telling the, the stories of people now. Um, so, for example, in our Pacific Encounters Gallery, we are also telling kind of the, the story of the communities and the legacies um, that have, have been left there and, and the current kind of uh, struggles that they're facing partly due to, to climate change. And what um, are the stories that people respond really well to? Because, you know, we're facing, in our relationship with the ocean, we're facing a, there's so much stuff, it's so complicated. And yet, even the most basic stories, people perhaps don't know. What do people really respond to when it, when it comes to ocean stories? Um, I think at the, the moment, perhaps one of the, the stories that, that people have engage with the most is the, the narrative of, of plastics in the ocean and single-use plastic um, being this this huge threat um, and kind of really iconic images like the seahorse um, wrapping wrapped around the kind of the cotton bud or the q-tip 
um, and this idea of the kind of plastic gyrus. And I think people have really, really um, latched onto this because it's a really simple narrative. Um, if I don't buy a plastic bottle, I instead carry around my metal bottle. All the problems are, are solved. And I think that's where we just need to be a little bit careful because obviously plastic is a huge threat to the ocean. Everything that we're kind of over consuming and discarding is having this impact. However, the situation is much, much more kind of complicated than that. Um, and it's human nature to want a, a problem to be very, very simple and very, very solvable through one action. Um, I think one of the, the really tricky um, roles of a museum is actually trying to show the layers, <laughs> trying to encourage that kind of critical thinking, that challenging, and actually being honest and saying we don't yet have the solutions to the, to the problems that we're knowing that we're facing, but presenting kind of different ideas. And I'd like to ask that same question to both Michael and Alex. This question of the complexity, perhaps Michael first, you are, you're not an ocean person, I think you would say, you know, natively. You've walked into this world of the ocean and it's complicated. How, how do you pick the parts of that to highlight in a piece of artwork? Well, that is a very tricky thing because um, you can't overload people with lots and lots of information or they switch off. And I think of my work is just an entry point you know it's just a point of contemplation it's not a series of answers it's just a, an opportunity to engage with one aspect or in the case of pollution pods the complexity of it is driven through the smells and the atmosphere and that can be quite complex um, it, it, it's trying to break things down into different senses, um, a different kind of environments that people go into, but without it being didactic in any way. I mean, there's nothing I hate worse than a sculpture that's made out of sort of bits of plastic find out of the sea in the shape of some sort of fish or you know, fish or bird. You know, I just can't stand that sort of stuff. Um, it, because it is, it is a lot more complex. Um, that being said, I still think when you then, our lifestyles lead to lots of complex problems, but some of the solutions are quite simple and they do come down to the way we consume and the amount we consume. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the start and end points can be quite simple and they can be a huge amount of complexity in the middle. And Alex, your perspective on this as well, because you, like me, you you deal with the science of this. And the thing I feel about being an ocean scientist is that I all I learn is more about what I don't know. There's the physics and the chemistry and the biology, and there's things on large scales and things on small scales, and there's so much of it. How how do you see this issue of how we, you know, honestly communicate the complexity without making everyone switch off? Yeah, it's it's a really difficult uh, problem. But I, I think uh, one thing that uh, you have to try and do, uh, as, um, as uh, Michael just said, is really, uh, you know, get people to connect with the ocean and start to think about its relevance to, to us. Um, and that, that, you know, I say, well, you know, the oxygen in every second breath you take is coming from the microscopic algae in the surface of the ocean. Um, you know, uh, gases released from algae in the ocean uh, act as nuclei for clouds, which then drop rain on you. Um, people can start thinking, oh, yeah, well, maybe the ocean is relevant to uh, my life beyond a plate of fish and chips. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you have to think about uh, these ways to communicate with people and really show them how important the ocean is. And then uh, you can engage a bit more in, okay, well, you know, the ocean is now suffering these consequences of our sort of direct and indirect, uh, you know, impacts on the ocean. Um, but then a part of the narrative is that's really important is this, look, you can do something about this. Uh, you can do things yourself, but you can also ask your, you know, politicians, your government to do things, you can join organisations which help magnify your voice. So I think what's really critical is not, is not to leave people feeling hopeless, but to really empower them 
to kind of, you know, grasp the ocean and really understand it and love it. Uh, and then to feel empowered to do something uh, to really conserve it for uh, future generations. Well, that is, we are pretty much out of time and that is a great final point. But on that note, I would like to ask each of you if there's something that people can do uh, that, you know, reflects a better relationship with the ocean, perhaps something that's taking action that's positive, what would each of you recommend? Not necessarily the obvious things either. Laura, let's start with you. What would you recommend for someone who would like to do their bit to um, improve our relationship with the ocean? Um, I feel like the simplest thing we can do is just to use less. Um, as consumers, our, our greatest power is um, to be more thoughtful about what we do consume, but ideally um, use a lot less things. Michael, how about you? What's your what's your action that people can take? <laughs> I think my action would be to swim right into the middle of the ocean, but don't <laughs> wear any suntan lotion when you're doing it. <laughs> That's a very severe recommendation, but yes. <laughs> I think that'll te definitely teach you a thing or two, wouldn't it? <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, just connect with it. Just just go out there and swim about in it um, and try not to drown would be a good thing. Excellent, excellent advice. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I think my one's a, a little similar to uh, Mike's in that, you know, I think people should should get out there and learn more about the ocean. So uh, try and understand what's out there, what's in your local uh, coastal seas, but also what's out there in the deep where I like to spend time uh, and go and see, you know, these really marvellous, uh, creatures in situ uh, living down at great depths in the ocean. Brilliant. Thank you all so very much. Um, we So for World Oceans Day, this is only, obviously only one of the events. There are plenty more. So if you look at the uh, Royal Museum's Greenwich website, rmg.co.uk slash World Oceans Day, you'll find science and craft ideas and videos and debates and all kinds of things to help you uh, develop your relationship with the ocean. There's even a pub quiz later on tonight, I think. So do go and have a look at that. And the material will all stay on the website so you can enjoy it into the future as well. Do get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Just search for Royal Museums Greenwich. We would love to hear from you. And it only remains to me to thank our fabulous four contributors, Elisa Kapakwaluk, uh, Laura Boone, Michael Pinsky and Alex Rogers. Our producer was James Gill and I'm Helen Cheresky. Enjoy the rest of World Oceans Day and see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>